All right. Welcome to episode 83 of Seize the Moment podcast. And we want to welcome back a special guest. We have Helen de Cruz. Uh, she's a professor of philosophy and Danforth chair in the humanities at St. Louis University in Missouri. And her latest book, co-edited with Johan de Smit and Eric Schwitzgebel, is called Philosophy Through Science Fiction Stories, Exploring the Boundaries of the Possible. Welcome, Helen. Hi, guys. Nice to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming back on. And then so, Helen, I guess our first question is going to be in terms of the sort of the platform and the medium that you guys use, why did you guys choose science fiction to kind of, um, I guess, to use, use it as, I guess, for lack of a better term in this case, another, I'm going to use it again, a medium for sort of bringing public philosophy or bringing sort of philosophy, philosophy to the public sphere? We are all three of the opinion, although all the things I will say now are just really me because I'm not 100% sure if this is all three our opinion. But I think for this, I can say that our project started out with the idea that there are so many bridges between science fiction and philosophy. Science fiction is inherently philosophical. And science fiction is also a way in which people who normally would not think philosophy is for them or philosophy is interesting, it's a way for them to really get into philosophy and ask themselves really sophisticated philosophical questions, such as like, what if, you know, the world around us, this is like the classic example, what if the world around us isn't what it's, what we think it is? What if we are in a simulation or what if people are running a TV show and we're starring in it and everybody's faking things around us. So, you know, like that sort of scenario is really wild. And in philosophy, we often think about really wild scenarios. Uh, and I think that science fiction offers a way for people to, uh, to dive into uh, these sort of deep philosophical questions. So it seemed pretty natural to us to use short stories then to, you know, get people into thinking about certain philosophical topics. Right, so you- It makes sense. Go for it. Though. Sorry. Yeah, no, yeah, it makes sense because through uh, narrative driven stories, through um, human emotion, right, people, people really connect to that, right, and, and to put out philosophical ideas in a sort of a narrative driven space is a way for those ideas to sort of stick to them. Right. Sometimes, mm -hmm. I mean, it depends on the reader, right, and, and their style. But I feel like in most cases, and you may be of the same mind, um, some people would, uh, when they're reading philosophy, they may uh, they may have uh, not a like very little connection to it. Like it feels uh, dry, so to speak, to them. Mm -hmm. When you when you put ideas of let's say um, immortality. Uh, what would that be like uh, with AI in the future, let's say? Mm -hmm. like, there's that one short story uh, by uh, Sophia Samatar, I think. Yeah. Uh, and she wrote a book, um, The New Egyptian Book of the Dead, the one of the short stories. And I thought that one was uh, very fascinating because she explores the idea of the, the continuity of memory. If, if you were to be uh, taken from your your own flesh and blood and then placed in into a different body right um would you still be you mm -hmm. are you you if, if it's still your memories uh, for example and i thought that was one interesting aspect explored uh, in one of the short stories yeah i'm glad you mentioned this story because i really love it i love all the stories in our book but this one sort of struck me with a kind of deep emotional resonance because there's so much rich philosophical content in the story it's not just about afterlife and about what would make you you and her idea that our cultural uh you know our cultural stuff is just as important as like our memories and our personality and so on in bringing that to the afterlife. And if you have to imagine a, a, a science fiction afterlife with nanobots, then it's going to have to be something that brings that on board. But I also really like the idea of justice that is sort of explored throughout the book. Like if we have immortality, who can benefit from it? Like only the super wealthy or should we try to get this out? Like, I don't want to put any spoilers to the story. So this is where I'll stop. But I thought that was really unexpectedly sort of emotional and, and interesting. Right, and it's like, from what I remember- Have you ever heard of, uh, oh. 
So from what I remember about the Egyptian Book of the Dead is that it was essentially, at least in its <laughs> in, wait, actually, yeah, in its inception, that uh, the pyramid texts were essentially only meant for the pharaohs. And then it's like, as it kind of progressed, and later on, it became available to more people, it only became available, again, in another sort of medium through the conduit of the priests, where they essentially sort of sold it to people. And they said, mm -hmm. well, yeah, if you want an afterlife, obviously, you know, you have to kind of pay for it. And so yeah. what, what's so interesting, and this is not... So I just want to be careful how I'm going to phrase this. So what's interesting is that in the kind of, and I don't mean to get into this or bash anybody, but I think it is important to explore, like when we're talking about, like, let's say the new age movement and, you know, those people are kind of like really fixated on like these, um, these kind of like funeral texts, right? And they're like, well, you know, in the Egyptian kind of culture, as a progression of our understanding of the afterlife, you know, they believed, you know, such and such that we kind mm -hmm. of went to the stars and then, you know, we kind of helped the pharaohs or whatever it was, right? So they believe it's kind of a version of truth or reality. But I think the thing that sort of proponents of, um, of an afterlife perspective don't talk about is that most of the time the afterlife was actually only meant for the select few, for these elites. So mm -hmm. whether we're talking about pharaohs or whether we're talking about sort of the aristocracy in ancient Egypt, yeah, so the, the afterlife was only in the possession or in the perceived possession of only the people who could kind of afford it, which obviously begs the question of like, is there such an afterlife if only like, you know, the select elite or whatever, you mm -hmm. know, what kind of like God or whatever would sort of create a world where only the elite can get into or can achieve immortality it doesn't really make much sense but um i guess like what was it that um i guess i don't know if you're okay with talking about like that version of the text um with that version of your book or that part of your book was there any part of it that like this author addressed like this kind of um the eliteness or the kind of aristocratic uh i guess you know sort of underpinnings of the afterlife Definitely, yeah. So this is one of the central elements of the story. I'm going to try not to spoil it too much of it, but it's like the question, like the two people in the story, the, 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 the two important characters have very radical visions of what an afterlife should look like and what justice would mean. Like what would be a just afterlife? A just afterlife is not just one where only the super wealthy can, can be. Like it would be pretty crap if that were the afterlife and it's sort of like I thought that was I don't know I, I love this story like I love all the stories uh but uh, I, you know it's it stood out to me emotionally have you heard of um the show it, it came out on Netflix some time ago it's called Altered Carbon I didn't know I didn't see it like could you could you briefly say something about it so so what's uh, what's fascinating is so it takes place in, in the future and uh, people have access to this technology that's sort of uh, placed on the back of your on the nape of your neck connecting to your uh, spinal cord It's something called a, a stack long story short what you're able to do is by implanting this thing you're able to upload your or rather download your consciousness to this thing and in a sense you could place this uh, stack on other bodies and essentially be immortal, right? And so this takes place in a dystopian future where the rich uh, live for hundreds of years, hundreds of years, and they have uh, access and also uh, have access to the best uh, uh, health and all that. Like you'll, you'll notice that some of the uh, people in the story who aren't very rich, they'll also be able to continue on living, but they'll come back in bodies that's not even the gender that they would have chosen. Or let's say it's an old man. Uh, he died. He may be placed in the body of a little girl um, or uh, s someone uh, may be put into a body that's uh, broken uh, or uh, differently abled, uh, let's say. Um, and it was a fascinating sort of dynamic to see like what the future may look like uh, with the, when the balance of power is, is shifted, you know, with these uh, people who are incredibly rich living for hundreds of years or thousands of years. I found this quite an interesting aspect also of, of our book uh, is, is the following. So when you imagine futures, particularly dystopia, utopia. So there's been some discussion about the philosophy of dystopia and utopia. And there have been some recent books about, you know, what would be the good of utopia. And, and one of the problems with dystopia is, I didn't see this show, but one of the problems is that it just sort of basically takes certain things like extreme wealth inequality and takes them as given. 
like there's this quote, not by Zizek, unfortunately, I don't know who really said it, but Zizek appropriated it. Like, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. Mm-hmm. Um, and, mm-hmm. and in a sense, a lot of dystopian stories are like that. Like they uh, talk about extreme wealth inequality and the rich just appropriating everything for themselves and the rest of us scrambling by in a less and less good world like you see this in so many different like you see them Blade Runner and other classics uh, and maybe you also see it in this show but it's also possible to imagine like futures that are a little less bleak so for example you have Mark Silcox's story with the with the monsters and you have this sort of cosmopolitan vision of inclusiveness uh, I don't know if you read that one but it's it's like so the question is like, what would happen? What if not everybody's on board with that? And I thought it quite interesting to think about different futures. So in a sense, you know, utopian futures could give us a different sort of way of imagining or doing philosophy because they kind of think like, what if, you know, wealth inequality isn't inevitable and it, it isn't because, you know, humans have lived for hundreds of thousands of years without extreme wealth inequality so in a sense it isn't it isn't inevitable and that's also interesting so i like both dystopia and utopia to to help us think about about futures and and how humans you know relate to each other interesting and then you know my thinking is from going back to kind of religion and you know christianity i think the idea was in that kind of comment of like well if you believe in me you will sort of live or eternally or i think he said you will have everlasting life i think the idea there is that we're sort of narrowing out the kind of playing field for immortality whereas before maybe sort of the immortality or diversion i guess of immortality was something aspired to only by the elite whether let's say it's uh, Mm -hmm. and it's mostly i was going to say maybe the difference between somewhere like philosophical elite where uh um, you can kind of know or like reach enlightenment or something like that and then you can attain immortality but which was always I think tied up in my understanding with kind of aristocracy because who really had the time to sit there and ponder the universe and reach the afterlife right so my thinking is when Christianity came to the fore there was this idea of like no it actually doesn't matter you don't have to be intellectual you don't have to be wealthy all you have to really do is believe in Christ and that kind of never uh, narrowed the sort of not narrowed it leveled the playing field where now the idea is that immortality was something that was literally a Attainable by anybody anywhere. This is a very interesting idea. So indeed, you're right. Like uh, so, Thomas Aquinas says somewhere in the in the Summa Contra Gentilis, he says somewhere like, you know, faith is something that is available to everybody, and you don't need to. He says, what if you have a, a peasant? I think he uses this word rusticus, who just doesn't have the time to, you know go into all the details should he could he not be saved well he could be because you know faith is just a matter of of accepting certain doctrines so at least that is the case in the catholic tradition so in different traditions you have a bit of a different idea about what faith is but it's interesting that they then sort of try to put the line differently so for example in in sort of particularly more popular philosophy of religion there's a question about universalism so you have david bentley hart and other people who have have uh, talked about, you know, the possibility that everybody ultimately goes to heaven. And then you have other people who have like strong objections to that, like pick your moral monster, like, you know, should he go to heaven? Like really? Mostly he, sometimes she. Should should this person really be there? Like, do I want to be there? Uh, so so it's kind of interesting that they then try to put the lines differently. So on the one hand, they level the playing field. On the other hand, they sort of make a kind of like what it means, particularly some streams in Christianity, to be saved by Christ and to be born again. And you know, so people would love to sort of say like, this is afterlife for me and people like me, and and not for other people. Right. And it's like, and it seems like a dystopia would literally be that, or at least I guess a version of dystopia would be that where the afterlife is only available for the rich and powerful. So it's like, you know how you have like these movies like 2012 or whatever, where Mm -hmm. only the rich are saved. This would be something similar. This would be like a spiritual version of it where it's like only the, yeah, only if you're rich and powerful, like you get to live forever and then everybody else kind of like disappears into the ether or whatever. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, So that, that, that's definitely one of the themes uh, that we look at. Alan, you were going to say something? Yeah, and I like, yeah, I like how uh, part three of the book 
um, which was uh, introduced uh, by you. Um, it's interesting. It, 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 it gets into why do we exist or quite questions like uh, what's our uh, purpose for existing? What is um, the nature of, of God? If God is all good and uh, all knowing, then um, why is evil exist? And, and, and I like how those sorts of um, ideas are, are tackled in the book. And I was hoping maybe with that, I guess without spoiling the stories, uh, if maybe you could uh, talk about what um, that part of the book kind of gets into. Yeah, so we called this part of the book, I need to just look here. It's what, yeah, we called it Gods and mm -hmm. Families because we talk about relationships between humans and uh, sort of duties they have towards their families. And then uh, the kind of um, more sort of religious, spiritual relationships and the tensions between those two. So one of the, so we have two reprints in the book. And one of those reprints is Ted Chiang's Hell is the Absence of God, which I find one of the most devastating stories that I have ever read, like full stop. It is just, it's just horrible. Like it, it's, 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 so basically long story short, without spoiling it too much, you have this guy called Neil. And this is a world in which angels, uh, like there is no, question about the existence of God. We know God exists in this world. And God exists, we know this because angels will visit people and do all sorts of miracles like heal the sick and so on. But also they will, whenever they come, something horrible happens. Like this is the equivalent of like a bomb explosion. So many people will die. And Neil's love of his life, Sarah, dies when such an angel comes to visit. And he is just devastated. He is crushed and he's angry. And she was uh, faithful. So she, well, she didn't believe it. Everybody believes in God, but she loved God uh, and he just couldn't. But the problem is only people who love God go to heaven. Everybody else goes to hell, which is not a bad place. It's just a place without God, like this total absence of God. And so Neil uh, spends the rest of the story trying to find ways to make himself love God, even though he despises and detests God for doing this so that he can be reunited with her. And that's a really interesting tension between like the religious and the, uh, the sort of human relationships. And you see it in a sense in, in all three stories. So they work very well together. So you have, um, um, yeah, there's four stories even. So you have uh, Chris, Christopher Mark Rose's story it is about this this physicist who is just devastated because his um, his daughter uh, is going to live with her her mother and the new spouse of the mother and he's just so so much uh, there's so much hurt and pain in there and I don't know how to continue this without totally spoiling the story but I'm just going to say in the abstract that the story is about the sort of very humanly felt pain and then the sort of more cosmic kind of responsibilities that you might have if you create an entire universe like you know uh, and, and it kind of the story raises this question about you know what if god isn't all good and all powerful what what if he's just a really sad physicist like so you get all these things and yeah you know like maybe physicists are able to do this sort of thing like making new universes come come to life uh, and, and similarly, in Francis Howard Snyder's story, you have this, uh, this question about what if you could truly have something like Christian's charity, which is like, so Kierkegaard talks about this, this charity as something that is so radical because neighborly love is love for everybody. It's not just love for your family. Anybody can love your family. Like, you know, Jesus at some point says it somewhere. That, you know, even even horrible people love their families. I mean, uh, everybody loves their families. But, um, you know, what would it concretely mean if you could engineer your mind in such a way that you truly had impartial love for everybody? Uh, and you can imagine how that goes horribly wrong. Like, you know, for one thing, you can't give money to everybody equally. Like, you know, what if your child has to go to college? And, you know, what if you... <laughs> We find it perfectly acceptable to have things like college funds for our children, 
but uh, you know, it, it, it's not really compatible with this sort of radical idea of neighborly love. So that, that's kind of the, the tension uh, that she looks at. And then the story by Hart Hudson, uh, who is a philosopher of religion, also like, like Francis Howard Snyder, um, gets into the question of, uh, of demons and, and how, you know, what it would be like to experience the sense of a demon. So it's sort of like they're, they're all connected with the duties to your family, religious experience, and it's, it's a really interesting collection, I think. Very interesting. So would you then say that like, um, let's say if there was a, I guess, empathy for all type version of reality where we just sort of felt for everybody, would that be a kind of dystopia then? Well, um, so so people have been thinking about this, like, for example, the warring state philosopher Murza, um, he talked about this quite a bit, and he thought that this would be a utopia, because he says, think about it, the reason that, that we have thieves is not so much that people dislike other people, but that the thief cares more for his own family and for his own house than for the house of the stranger that he's going to ransack. And similarly, why is there war? Is it because people hate other countries? No, it's because we love our own countries more. So he thinks if the whole world were arranged in such a way that impartial love is possible, then you know things would be so much better. Uh, but it's kind of hard to see. Like, so it feels to, to me that something essential would be lost, uh, something about proximity of relationships. And there is a sort of, there is a contingency in that because after all, you didn't choose your parents, for instance. And in a sense, you didn't choose your children either. Like now we have the luxury often to choose whether we have children or not, but even so, how they specifically turn out, you just don't know. Uh, and so there is a kind of beauty, I think, in that contingency, in the fact that there is a coincidence in who we end up being with and who we end up caring for the most. But I do feel the force of this other thing, of the impartial caring or the neighborly love, that we do have to have more of that because otherwise you have just, you know, super rich people who put on trust funds for their kids while other people are starving. And it's very clear that that's wrong. So we look a bit at the tension between those two, two ideals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it kind of makes me think and of what's fascinating. Go ahead, Alan. Um, no, just what's what's fascinating is just through even hearing you parse that out, like how you think about it, right? And on one level, how having empathy for all could be a good thing, but on another level, the proximity of relationships is also another thing to consider. I mean, the fact that that story or stories like the ones uh, in in the book uh, sort of um, inspire uh, these different ranges of, of thought. Um, that's what's important about, about these stories is what I'm noticing, right? It, it starts to make you think of these multiple different perspectives that you could, that you could take, um, right? Like uh, one of the stories uh, has to do with uh, loving your neighbor as you would that yourself, right? But then at the same time, uh, what's, how does that tension resolve with your own children um, versus like if you had to choose between a neighbor and your own child, right? And um, on some level, you think that that's, uh, it almost seems like a common sense question. Maybe somebody else would be like, no, no, of course my child. But asking, posing the question and then relating it to what you're taught in religion and what people hold so dearly, faithfully, um, certain principles and ideas, um, it's, it's great how stories like that make you wrestle with these thoughts. It, you're not just uh, blindly accepting you have dogmatically, this is how I have to live. Um, you're actually questioning it. That's right. So I think this is really what good fiction, what enduring fiction does, is it doesn't give us answers. Like the moment it does, I think it doesn't great fiction anymore. Like, I feel that there has to be some space for us as the audience to engage with the ideas. And surely, you know, very often the author does bring their own idea to it. And they have a very clear idea about, but nevertheless, uh, it's good to use this just as a starting point. And I think 
at least as a philosophy professor, that's what I often try to do. I don't, I don't really care that much about whether my students will remember, you know, what exactly I think. So for example, what Kant said, it is important to the extent that they, if they really get a sense of what Kant said about a certain topic, for example, morality, that they can use that and think, is this, is this right? Like, is Kant right that it's never okay to lie, for example? This is something, you know, if you want to get philosophy students riled up, give them the axe murderer at the door story. You know, like, it's a story. It, Kant didn't invent it. It was Benjamin Constant who invented it in response to Kant. So Kant says it's never okay to lie because you use uh, somebody else as a mere means. Uh, you basically do something they would never rationally agree to, et cetera, et cetera. So what if there is an axe murderer at the door and your friend is in high? hiding like what do you do do you do you help you know you should help your friend and you know Kantians now would say you'd say things like I'm sorry I cannot divulge the, the location of my friend <laughs> but they wouldn't lie you know and and sure the axe murderer would agree to could rationally agree to that could see your point of view uh, you know but my students will just say who cares about the axe murderer I mean you have to help your friend so so that's that's the sort of thing I think it's important to really try to give philosophical positions with subtlety and then people have to think about them and see what they, you know, that all these ideas are so, so relevant and interesting and important and the same with fiction. So, so that's, I think the power of fiction is that it doesn't really need to give an answer. Like somebody like Kant at least has to say, this is what I think on the matter. Uh, but in a fiction story, you can, you can even leave that, you know, not spelled out. You could you could leave it open. You could feel this tension between, say, neighborly love and uh, you know, radical, uh, so, so sort of more family based love. You could feel that that tension, and just leave it unresolved. And I think Francis Howard Snyder's story basically sort of shows the bad consequences, but I think leaves it unresolved. Yeah, and what I love about philosophy so much, and this is not necessarily my idea, obviously, but I think philosophy helps to make us more fully human. And so what I mean by that is like, if you think about us as like, um, I don't know, this sort of, uh, I, I guess, primitive kind of pool of cognitive distortions and uh, cognitive distortions and impulses and sort of like these urges that are, you know, kind of like these id urges that are so hard to kind of resist, right? If we're thinking of philosophy as being a fully, I guess, human and fully capable human being, what we're thinking is that, let's see how I can describe it. What we're thinking is that we're essentially, despite the fact that we may not necessarily have answers as to what the right or wrong, like moral or ethical system is, that's not the point, I think. I think the point of being a philosopher, aka being a kind of fully kind of formed or mature human, is the ability to decide, the ability to kind of see the all of the kind of options in front of you and to say, okay, based on my own reasoning, this is the best option. So whereas, again, if we're kind of a little bit more primitive in our development, the ideas are, you know, we're kind of impulsive and we're saying like, I want food, Therefore, you know, I'm going to run after X, Y, or Z, and I'm going to get it. So with philosophy and becoming thinkers, right, I love mm -hmm. this idea that it's not about the right answers, but the questions are important because it really gets us to be ourselves. And again, what I mean by that is, you know, kind of reaching our potential and what we're capable of doing in terms of the people we are, we are in relationships, in terms of the society that we build. And what I love about your stories is that, again, there are no particular right answers, but it gets the person to say, you know what, but being human is actually asking the questions. Definitely right. So I feel like this is obviously a very existentialist theme. Like, you know, the thing when Sartre uh, said, so you have this student who asked, what should I do? Should I go into resistance or should I help my mother? And Sartre said, well, you, you should make a choice. Like, you know, but you make a choice. You you think about what, what you should do. And that is what is to be human. Like we don't live our lives according to some sort of automatized script, but rather we make decisions and we form opinions. And it's, it's really interesting to note that I find um, in American society, and I could just pontificate about that since I just moved here last year, but anyway, I'm gonna do it. In American society, there is this kind of weird neo-Darwinian sort of idea about that we should just make a lot of money, that the economy is super important, and that basically, Things like, you know, personal flourishing are all subservient to the economy. Uh, and it's kind of this mm. weird thing that all said and done, if you made a lot of money, then, you know, you, you have become 
you have fulfilled apparently all your life potential, but it seems to me like it's so easy to think of somebody who does all that, who goes on the stock market and who makes a lot of money. In fact, there is a story, a philosophical story that's quite interesting on that. Uh, what's it called again? The movie, the movie goer by Walker Percy. You have a stockbroker and he's very good at stockbroking, but he, uh, at some point he realizes like, what am I doing? What is my life? You know, what, what, what is the purpose of the stuff that I'm doing? And these questions just remain. And it's interesting, those questions are not just the purview of the super wealthy. Anybody can do philosophy. Philosophy is truly democratic. Like you don't even need a formal education. Like you, philosophy happens everywhere in cafes, hopefully soon in the future uh, as well. And I think it's really important that people get empowered to do so and to think, in, in ways that are like subtle and non-obvious and get the tools to be able to do that. And that really separates us from more like this sort of weird fake Darwinian world where we just have to reproduce and make money, you know, but be something more than that. Interesting. So it's like philosophy as a way to rise above. Yeah, I think so. Like I have this very romantic vision of philosophy that helps us do that. Uh, and and it's, it's a theme, you see it in so many people, like you have Dawkins, for instance, who thinks we're just survival machines for our genes. But nevertheless, we are people who can stand in awe of the world, who can reflect on the world, who can, you know, think about, we can reflect on our own existence. And that's a really, truly wondrous thing that that is precious and that we should, you know, encourage people to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's yeah. Uh, there was a. Go ahead, Alan. Mm. So, so there was a, sorry, there was a movie. Um, forget the name. I think it was Dinner with Zelik. I, I could really ha be butchering the name of it. It was a existential. It's a movie of a of, of conversation. Uh, no, did my dinner with Andre? Something like that. I think that's what it was called. Mm. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I remember them discussing themes of like, uh, that were also very philosophical in nature. Like one, just what, what are they doing there in New York? Like what, what purpose are, are they uh, getting there from living just to sort of, uh, like, like you said, Helen, to serve the, uh, the economy, to just make more money, to just uh, survive and, and reproduce. Um, Andre, if I remember correctly, discussed like his experiences of going to a retreat or or, or uh, out in nature uh, with a group of people and making these beautiful, uh, wonder, wondrous connections with them, and uh, feeling feeling this sort of sense of community, and um, and I just like how they explored different um, different styles of living life. And what does one style of life give you versus another style of life? Um, yeah. Yeah, these are really fun movies. I like, I like that one. And there's, there's several others similar. I'm just trying to think now where you basically have people talk the whole time. Like, so the French movie director, Eric Romer, that's basically the sort of movies he made. Mm. The movies are just people talking. And there's usually some romantic story as well, but the, the plot line of that is almost immaterial to, you know, the discussions that, that go on. Uh, and I, I do like, like that sort of uh, philosophical fiction. I think that, uh, I mean, I, I've always liked it even before I was a philosopher. Uh, and there's something fun about, about uh, just enjoying other people's conversations about, about these topics. Yeah, and it's like, and then also my thinking is when it comes to philosophy, it also gives you a sense of like self-image and self-esteem. So something that Alan like talks about a lot, which I love, is that when we're talking about kind of, again, going back to impulses, when we're talking about sort of thinking things through and sort of like understanding other people's perspectives, um, coming up to sort of resolutions, conclusions together, et cetera, the idea there is that essentially you're, you're building up kind of your framework of who you are, mm -hmm. that, you know, I kind of went from this kind of immature person or this sort of childlike person to a rational or a more rational 
rational actor in the world. And again, I think the thinking with philosophy is it's not about, and I mean, obviously it's sort of everybody knows this, I guess. It's not about the kind of right answers or having particular right answers, but it's more about sort of your engagement in dialogue and your engagement in discussion. And actually, Alan, I want to kind of bring this or take this to you, right? Um, so what is it like for you, right? When you're kind of able to like, I don't know, resolve a particular issue or understand another person's perspective, especially in the context of where, let's say maybe initially you felt yourself kind of angry or riled up, or you felt like, you know, you couldn't sort of make it work with you two sort of, yeah. So the idea kind of there is like, what is it like for you to kind of see yourself in that context where you were able to, I guess, sort of philosophically or through dialogue or both, obviously, where you were able to kind of come to some sort of resolution with someone? Mm, if, uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think it was, um, I could be getting the philosopher wrong, but it might be St. Francis of Assisi who um, put out this idea of uh, seeking first to understand uh, then to be understood. Um, I really like that idea because uh, that and many others, of course, um, it, it, it's a great way to sort of lead to uh, conflict resolution and to sort of um, here's the thing from from all the different works of uh, fiction, nonfiction, uh, philosophy, science, psychology, uh, all, throughout all these different fields, one thing that was always interesting to me, especially especially in the literary world as well, is you see that people have all these different kinds of perspectives. And everyone generally thinks to, tends to think that they're right, no matter what uh, angle they're coming from, they generally feel this, this sense of the way I came to this, this is correct, and I'm good. Uh, and I'm a good person. And for whatever reason, you know, this other person is opposing my viewpoint, therefore, you know, we're at odds right now. And I, I tried to see that, you know, everyone generally might take that kind of view, right? And that generally nobody on purpose is trying to how do I put this? It's not like they try to purposefully put a perspective out there uh -huh. and, and impose it on you. S sometimes it's just that they genuinely think that what they're saying is right. And when they hear something opposing that's different, you tend to get into uh, conflicts, right? But if I try to consider, you know, why does this person think what they think? Why do they think that they're uh, correct? And maybe even, uh, what's it called, a steel man, their position. Like, I'll try to say why they think what they think as best as, as the way that they're mm -hmm. presenting it. So this way I can see it from their side. And then I may present what it is that I uh, think. And hopefully because I, I gave that um, ability to be open and listen to their perspective, most of the time, because they feel understood, it'll sort of create this sort of rapport and allow for you to put out, you know, your own perspective. And then then this sort of process of integration might occur. Um, not always. It might even just stop at the level of, OK, at least I feel understood by you. We're not going to agree, but I feel understood. Uh, but sometimes if it's if it's just right, the way things work out, you may then be able to integrate and learn something new, uh, both uh, parties or, or more parties if they're involved. Right. So w would it be accurate in saying that your kind of self-esteem or your self-image comes more from, or rather less from being right or like winning an argument and more so about kind of seeking truth and integrating particular, let's say, I don't know, conflicting points? What, my own personal self-esteem? <laughs> yeah, I'm just wondering kind of how you see yourself as a, sort of as a philosopher, as a human in the world. Like, do you find that for you, it's more important to pretty much to kind of philosophize and be able to kind of, again, sort of integrate or at least hear out like different perspectives and to tolerate them as opposed to just being right and kind of bludgeoning people with your arguments? Oh, I mean, I've seen, I mean, I and, and I'm sure both of you have seen enough conflict and extreme, uh, extremely negative low level behavior in the world where it's like there's this compulsion to want to see the opposite of it like you mm -hmm. you you kind of are s sort of seeking harmony so i mean like that that's how i feel i just kind of would feel like uh i'd like to make someone who thinks they're my enemy into a friend cuz i feel like the whole enemy thing is is an illusion um and it's like uh, there's, I mean, I'm not a religious person, but there is this um, 
I think Jesus said it, uh, forgive them for they know not what they do. So some, sometimes people don't know that they're making like a, a cognitive error. Sometimes I don't know that I'm mm-hmm. making a, like some sort of error in uh, judgment. Sometimes I'm biased, right? Because sometimes I'm biased, maybe I'm wrong. So let me consider that I could be wrong. Uh, maybe they're right. And by just giving that sort of branch out there, then maybe they'll start to present information differently. Um, and we'll just come to some sort of uh, resolution. Like, I don't know, the driving force is, is harmony, really. Is it a self esteem mm. thing? I, I guess it just depends on the, the semantics. But it, it's just like, uh, I kind of got tired of seeing things happen unnecessarily. Yeah. And Helen, so for you, broadly speaking, what would you say is sort of, I'm sure there are multiple answers to this, but what would you say is, I guess, if there's like one main one that sticks out to you, the point of philosophizing or being or becoming a philosopher? Hmm. I think, so I once asked this question on Twitter, <laughs> like, it seems to me that philosophy, and of course, philosophers were taking issue with this, they always do, like if you say, it seems to me that philosophy has its roots in two possible sort of drives. One is the drive of wonder, you know, like the whole, the Theetetus um, idea of philosophy is born in wonder. The other is that philosophy is built in argumentation and making the best possible case for your uh, work. And to me, philosophy is really squarely in the wonder department. So when I write philosophical nonfiction, when I just write articles or books, I don't do much in the way of uh, objections and replies and stuff like that. I'm not interested in that. Like, I mean, obviously it's interesting to hear, but I think I can't really anticipate what people are going to object to my work. Um, And I'm not so much interested in building a watertight argument as I am in sort of looking at something in a new way. Uh, So I think that's what philosophy is really good at. And that's why philosophy will never be replaced by the sciences or whatever, because, and you know, the moment that scientists are really asking these sorts of fundamental questions, I think they are just still doing natural philosophy. I think that they call it science now, but some of the stuff that goes on in uh, fundamental physics or biology is just really philosophy. It's just a sort of thinking, trying to look at the world in a different way and trying to think about you know, why, why is this the way it is? And, and what are the implications if this were the case? So it's a kind of wonder tool. I think philosophy helps us with thought experiments, with arguments. It helps us to, to consider situations and positions that are non-obvious. And I think that's also what the best philosophical fiction is fiction that brings us a message that is not entirely obvious. To just give a few recent examples, I heard my hu- I overheard my husband say to the kids, and that is why Disney movies are kitsch because you know they always go for the cheap thrill. I hope I'm not offending any Disney fans, but anyway, like they always go for the, <laughs> the cheap thrill. That's why parents always die in Disney movies. It's so easy, right? Put your character in difficulties. How? Well, just kill off the parent. Bye bye, Bambi's mom. Bye bye, Dumbo's mom. Into prison you go, and and so on. And I kind of was thinking about this, like, okay, are Disney movies sketch? Like, I don't know, I've seen them so long now. But I think one of the weaknesses, particularly in older Disney movies, is this, this the message that they bring is really straightforward and, and not always philosophically interesting. Like Dumbo, what's the thing? Okay, suppose you're being bullied and imprisoned and harassed. No worries, if you have some great talent and some friends, you're going to shine, you're going to... And, and I don't know, like, is, is that a great message? Like, I don't know. I come to depreciate Dumbo, right? Uh, so so <laughs> I, like, I like a story that has a non-obvious, a conclusion that you think, like, so I'm now, for instance, reading to my son, The Last Unicorn. It's a book by Beagle. There's a really trippy movie from the 1980s with it. Unicorn, I don't know if you've seen it, like mm-hmm. it has music by America and it's drawn by Studio Ghibli people. Uh, and it's it's kind of very interesting because, oh. yeah. Do you remember this movie? If you're Generation X. No, I just, I know Studio Ghibli. Oh yes, well, yeah. So so this movie 
it's very interesting because it's about this king who he keeps he basically he's a kind of really tragic figure so he destroys everything he sees like you have some rulers like that they see beautiful things they just want to destroy them but he's also very tragic because he tries to to herd all these beautiful unicorns for himself and obviously this isn't making the situation better but the book raises all sorts of interesting questions about you know what beauty is what the authentic is how you can how would you be able to grasp or hold on to something elusive, beautiful and authentic uh, like a unicorn? And it's a really philosophically interesting uh, and it's, it's, it's made for kids, but it's still, I think it has this really interesting enduring message. So, so I think there is this kind of gauge for philosophical fiction. I think the more intriguing the philosophical conclusion is or the questions that it raises, the better it is as philosophical fiction. Yeah, and it's so interesting because like what we're thinking about then is like, is it worth sort of pursuing some sort of ideal, whether I mean, I'm assuming in this case, well, it is in this case, it's beauty, but I'm assuming this is sort of pertinent to kind of other sort of ideals, like, you know, we're, we're talking about kind of justice, um, we're talking about even maybe forms of achievement that even, mm -hmm. I don't know, particular people might I, I kind of idealize. But the interesting thing is you also have people on the other end who kind of won't settle for less, where the idea is sort of like chasing uh, this sort of proverbial or metaphorical dragon, where essentially you're pursuing beauty at the expense of maybe even reality. And so, Helen, do you feel like, um, well, have you read any stories where people sort of get trapped in these ideals, where they kind of, um, let's say, they pursue you know, maybe kind of like versions of platonic forms to the detriment of their own sort of lives or well-being, or maybe even to the detriment of their own relationships. Yeah, off the top of my head. So, so this is the, the tragedy of King Haggard in that story that I'm just reading now. Off the top of my head, yeah, that there are there are stories like that, but I'm needing to think about where where it goes wrong. So yeah, I think in general, I'm going, just going to speak at a higher level of, of, uh, of generality because I'm really bad at sort of coming up spontaneously okay. with examples like that, that, uh, you know, they can sort of show what, uh, yes. So in War and Peace, you have this character, I forgot his name, I think it's Alexandre or something, who is a friend of Pierre and he has this problem. He's too idealistic. Whereas Pierre in War and Peace, and this is a book, like I was daunted by that book. Like I thought, like people say like, oh, would you read War and Peace? Like, but I thought, look, I'm going to read War and Peace now. I mean, there's nothing much else to do. Let's mm -hmm. read it. But one thing I really liked is, so you have this, this main <laughs> character and there's so many characters, like it's a tapestry of characters, Pierre. And he is a very flexible person. He just wants to, he's seeking for something. Like he has just come into a lot of money and he's wondering, what should I do with my life? And he does all sorts of things. He joins the Freemasons. He does justice for the poor. And, you know, but ultimately he just sort of finds his way specifically because he is flexible and doesn't want to be tied down to any kind of philosophy. He just goes and sees this, this working for me. No, this is like, he's almost a pragmatist. Like this isn't working for me. I'm going to try something else. Whereas his friend Alexandre is much more ideal, idealistic, has these sort of really high level ideas. And he just crush, he, he completely gets crushed in the story. And I found it very interesting, the contrast between these people. So I think that, I think that you know, one thing with COVID is that uh, it just shows us like, who would have predicted that we are in this situation, right? You know, you have to have a flexible mm. philosophy. You have to be able to let your life experiences inform your philosophical outlook. And the other way around, your philosophical outlook is going to help you shape those experiences. I think that there is a danger in this sort of thing about, oh, yeah, if you suffer, you know, you'll learn from it and you'll come out of it better. But I think there is a way in which this sort of experiences does, does shape us. Like we will be... I hope that the, these sorts of pandemics is not going to happen frequently, uh, but this is a way in which we are all being shaped and in which we you know, can use philosophical tools to, to help us understand. And I think it's very important to be really flexible about that and to continue to have our life experiences inform, inform what we think. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like, yeah. go ahead, Alan. 
No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So, and it's like the thinking is it's like when we read about, like, I guess it's this sort of dystopian literature about pandemics or, you know, kind of widespread epidemics. The idea is there that there's like no way that something like that can ever happen. So I think a lot of times we sort of resign ourselves to the notion of, well, this is just fiction. So it's sort of just like kind of me having fun or me kind of like just living in my imagination. But interestingly enough, if we kind of infuse philosophy into it, then the idea is something along the lines of like, okay, well, what happens if there actually is a pandemic? Well, how will you live? What will you consider as important? Will you still continue to try to live your life in the way you did before? Or will you more so focus on the greater good of the community? So yeah, so it's, 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 it's hard to see. Yeah, like I just read Camus' The Plague. Mm -hmm. I thought it's another of those books mm -hmm. that I thought, if not now, when will I read it? It went very slow because I read it in French. and My French isn't great anymore. But I was struck by how accurate it was like it was uncanny the failings of government the the way that people get blunted by hearing the number of dead like he says this at some point like there were so many dead but you know at some point it just becomes meaningless it just becomes numbers in that little town in algeria where the plague happens like you know and people are wondering how many dead people are there anyway in any given week and it just becomes all meaningless and then you have the governmental failures, you have the sense of isolation, uh, like they're not an individual lockdown, but they are like isolated from the rest of the world. And I found it uncanny that Camus could, could reconstruct the phenomenology so well, because as far as I know, he was never in any plague. So how, how did he do that? I think it's really uncanny. I think in a sense that, uh, yeah, so, so that, that's the interesting thing, like uh, dystopia, that there is a certain thing about it that, you know, this, this can never happen. But, but in a sense, you know, we're slowly training ourselves to the possibility that dystopia is actually just at the doorstep, has actually arrived, uh, you know, with climate change. Uh, I mean, this has given rise to a whole generation of people who don't want to reproduce because they're saying, I don't want to bring kids into this world. So there's a sense in which dystopia is really a reality that we're living now. I think in a way that say our parents didn't quite live that way. Like they had maybe other things like the cold war and stuff like that. So maybe they had different, different dystopian visions, but that this is our dystopia. Like I think every generation has like its own sort of, a horrible scenario that can conceivably happen uh, right. waiting there. And would you guys agree that probably the ultimate dystopia is anti-philosophy or anti-philosophical, where it's like um, you have these certain realities or these certain truths that let's say the vast majority, if not all of the populace are like willing to accept or think about or consider? Hmm. You mean like 1984 as the yeah. ultimate dystopia because everybody, you know, like you have total thought control yeah, I think those are, in a sense, really scary because you sort of take away people's agency. I think that 1984 really shows well how agency and philosophical thinking are connected because I think philosophical thinking is another existentialist theme empowers us. Like, it's, it's not some icing on the cake. It is something that really helps us not just like, oh, what is the best decision in our everyday lives, but our sort of overall outlook and the way that we relate to power structures. Um, I don't know. I mean, this is like in continental philosophy, you see this very well. Like I was just reading about Foucault and his, uh, his work on the prison system, like the way that he sort of uh, used this philosophy to address questions like, you know, prison, obviously, how are you going to punish somebody? Well, put them in jail. No, says Foucault, this was very late very late that this happened, that imprisonment was the main way to, uh, you know, to, to, to punish people. And, and it, it's not necessarily the best way. Uh, so yeah, that, that's, uh, that's the empowering thing of philosophy, I think, individually and collectively. Alan, what do you think? What's sort of the ultimate dystopia to you? Well, I mean, just to sort of tag that 1984 reality with um, the idea of us not having agency, you could sort of argue that um, in the age of uh, social media and algorithms that sort of create these echo chambers, that in a sense, people are maybe at one point when they did have agency, when they were clicking on these things that originally uh, pushed the algorithm to give them more information, like maybe at one point that's, you know, they chose, but then after a, a certain amount of time, you're just kind of fed 
things that sort of uh, feed into your existing reality. And also you'll be given things that also in, enrage you uh, and keep mm-hmm. you also kind of ingratiated in that um, reality as well. Um, but what's fascinating though, is if I had to think of what philosophical tools we could sort of use to, um, philosophical, psychological tools we could use to sort of, uh, get out of this is, I mean, if there's, if the idea is that we design our environments and in turn, our environments design us, then essentially we, our agency exists there. Like we're able to then pick what it is that we want to look at, what it is that Mm. we want more of, right? Especially if you know how this uh, algorithm sort of works and and these echo chambers work, Um, maybe you could start looking at things that are counter to what it is that you currently um, are into. Like, for example, I don't know, as far as news goes, if you were only listening to one particular uh, news network, maybe go to this, uh, go to another one, another one, another one, click there and sort of see these opposing uh, pieces of information. If mm-hmm. that doesn't work, there's another thing. If it, if it doesn't exist on social media, then um, there's a saying, right? That you're the... Uh, you're the combination of the five closest people to you or the five closest influences. So what's fascinating is, especially with the pandemic, with all this downtime, you can choose uh, what you would like to look at, what it is that you want your world, your 24 hours to present to you and what kind of things you want to sort of uh, condition yourself to Mm. like how you want your brain to, to think. So for instance, um, people can can uh, read a, a philosophy book, right, and be introduced, uh, like the to short stories, right. They they could be introduced to different levels of of thinking, right, and have that sort of be part of their um, intuition, so to speak. Like because mm-hmm. a lot of the ways that, for example, we're we're kind of talking off the cuff here, and a lot of the things that we uh, presented here, whether it's. Uh, um, like, like Helen, like, for example, you bringing up uh, that story from Studio uh, Ghibli, right? Uh, that, that movie, uh, or um, War and Peace, or these things that sort of come to you automatically based on um, the context of the conversation. Mm-hmm. Well, I feel like depending on the things that people constantly condition themselves or expose themselves to, they could sort of rewire their brain to, to what it is that they intuitively feel um day to day Mm -hmm. or depending on the context it's a little complicated but essentially the simple idea is just uh you could design what uh is in your environment so this way your environment could then sort of design you i love that yeah that's a lovely idea um and it's it's empowering as well i think the one worry is so this is something that um a philosopher, I think his name is Kelly, but I forgot his first name. But uh, he says that there is a bit of a problem in that, suppose that you through all sorts of circumstance get uh, or an initial belief. It is totally rational for you to continue to go into that belief deeper and deeper, support it more and more, look for more and more evidence. And you see, that's how belief polarization works. So suppose that you are, say, a conservative uh, Christian who thinks the rapture is going to happen. You know, I mean, there's nothing inherently irrational about that belief. So I think one of the problems in this sort of dialogue that you hinted at earlier is that people think, oh, yeah, some people are just stupid and we shouldn't talk to them. But imagine that, um, you know, that you believe the rapture is going to happen. You're one of the good guys, uh, you know, because you came to Christ and, you know, political correctness is a horrible thing, et cetera, et cetera. And you can have all these beliefs because of, you know, people around you have those beliefs, uh, as you say, and then you sort of build them up better and better. And I've seen this in sophisticated, uh, say, conservative evangelicals. That's what they do. And there is nothing inherently irrational about this. There is nothing inherently irrational about uh, sort of doing this sort of stuff and, and entrenching yourself further and further. But you see, the problem is at some point you can't, talk to other people anymore and you are just so far out like 
and that's a problem. This is a big societal problem. So I do think that it's nice that we can do this. I think it's also nice that we have to almost allow ourselves to be shaped by things that are maybe not things that we seek out. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's no coincidence Hannah Arendt said that one of the problems with totalitarianism, so she wondered how do people, like this was the, the whole thing in several of her books, like how come people, nice, nice German people, how come they fall for something horrible like totalitarianism or similarly in Russia with Stalinism? Well, she says one of the problems is the fraying of the social fabric. If people are isolated and they only get to talk to other people like them, then they get susceptible to these totalitarian things, which sound very plausible and you never hear anything else, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why the sort of community dialogue with different voices is so important. Uh, and, and that's, I think, one thing we need to think about post-pandemic is to make that sort of relationships. And I know many people are doing this sort of in a bottom-up way to have a kind of, uh, you know, differences of viewpoints, ethnicity, you know, all sorts of different ways of us coming to, to similar problems. Um, yeah, anyway. Absolutely. And I, I feel like for me, I guess it's, uh, it seems like a really wonderful point to kind of end off. We already kind of, uh, looks like at the top of the hour. So Alan, final questions for Alan before we go, man? Oh, um, Helen, uh, if we wanted to follow you, follow your work um, and buy the book, uh, where, where could we find you? Uh, so you can find me. I have uh, just uh, an, uh, the Twitter account is at Helen Reflects, uh, Helen Reflects, just in one word. Uh, you can also find me with uh, HelenDeCruz.net, which is my um, which is my website. And the book is called Philosophy Through Times Fiction Stories, Exploring the Bounds of the Possible, which you can find in a variety of online bookshops if you Google that title. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on. This was so wonderful and insightful. Thank you Thank so you. much. All right, Alan, we'll talk to you soon. Right. Thank you. Bye. Take Bye. care. Okay. That was awesome. That was so good. All right, uh, guys, if you want to... Follow us, uh, follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on Facebook and on Instagram and at Seize underscore podcast on uh, Twitter. Like, subscribe, hit the bell. <laughs> and we'll see you uh, next time. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So see you next time. Thank you so much for watching and 